Um, because so far it's really not been having fun for me. Welcome to part two of today's recordings. You can possibly hear that there is a thunderstorm going on outside, so I'm not sure how this is going to affect the microphone. I'm not sure how it is going to affect things, so hopefully it'll work. So far it's been playing up something chronic. So, um, yeah. I finished recording videos with um, Daniel for SingTow on Monday uh, at about three o'clock, and it's taken me about 70 minutes to get to the point it's going to record the part two. So I had the slides ready, but it wasn't recording. So let's hope we can answer some of the questions that have come with part one with part two. Right. This is part two. This is about HMS Enterprise, hence I have her lovely crest there. Hopefully there will be a part three recorded, though probably not before the live at this rate, because I'm going to want to dive into a cold shower before I actually do the live. Maybe just walk outside in the rain. Um, so that's going to come up later, but basically I'm going to look at the enterprises which have come since World War II and what they've got up to, including the current operation ones involved in. Village pumps. Come on, you know you enjoy it. I know I do. This week's was more on China. We were trying to be topical this time. Where else to find me? Twitter, at AC underscore Naval History. Patron. And Global Maritime History. They're fun places to be. Right, let's look at the construction. So, someone, uh, Mr... Let me just look at this question. Johnny, uh, John Walkley, um, as, talks about how he thinks that in a quote, his comment is, HMS Emerald had seven to six inch guns at the time of the gold run. I don't think I didn't say she did, but uh, if I did, I apologize. I was writing through. Um, it was only after 1943 that her armament was reduced to five, six inch guns. I'm going to be going through more of the armament in this one. I divided it between part one and part two to try and get it down to 30 minutes. I've always regarded these as a follow-on from the Hawkins class. After seven point five inch shell proved it was too heavy at 2,000 pounds to handle. 200 pounds to handle. One was a heavy cruiser, one was a light cruiser. You can They are built like that for specifically with their armor loads. You can tell them, but I can understand your thinking of that. But it's wrong. Just because a ship is, and you put it, at over 9,000 tons displacement, she has almost twice the displacement of the Ds, and over twice the size of Major of Glasgow. Again, I'm going to be looking at the displacements. I no. Twice the size of HMS Glasgow. Uh, I'm presuming you mean the pre World War One town class cruisers, and I'm not really surprised that ships had kind of increased in size through World War One. But okay. On a personal note, and this might be why you're detecting some sarcasm coming through here. Why do you have an array of empty soda pop bottles and soft toys on display? Well, the soda pop is Iron Brew. I'm not sure I'd ever call it soda pop myself, and frankly, that's. Just part, growing up as part of the channel. As for the cuddly toys, um, I like them. That's it, basically. I like them. Um, why not tidy up and look a tan more professional? Uh, if cuddly toys are what make me not look professional, rather than me wearing a t-shirt every time, then I am... Um, seriously in trouble in the world. Also, in most academic offices I've ever been into, there is usually at least one or two cuddly toys bottling around these days, and usually a whole pile of books. And I would urge you to be prepared so your bit of yellow paper is where you need it, for the same reason. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, my bit of yellow paper went wandering this time, and as I was recording it quickly, instead of doing not what I normally do, because I was worried about not being able to deliver the introductions on time, I, ca I didn't stop and go back to the beginning and re-record. I carried on. I'm sorry if that upsets you, Mr. John Walkley. Frankly, you're bringing up my cuddly toys. Could be said to upset me. But that's your choice. Right then, let's get into this stuff. 
So, let's do some displacements. So, I'm going to disappear for a second. Um, Carlisle, 4,200 tons, 5,300 tons in full. Dene, 4,850 tons in standard, 6,030 tons in full. Now, in the nicest way, Emerald and Enterprise display 7,500 well, 50 tons in Emerald's case and 80 tons in Enterprise's case. Uh, 9,400. I'm not sure either qualifies as being double the weight. Uh, if you'd said 50% more, I would be in total agreement with you, but that would again put them as 50% more uh, than the Carlisle class, really, of the seas. And just looking up and checking... The Hawkins class weigh in at um, 9,860 tons in standard and 12,800 tons in full load. So they are in in-between, yes, but they're in in-between in that they are the town class cruisers of their period. And by town class, I'm referring to the 1930s town class. These are the large light cruisers which the Royal Navy's building. It's not a design which can, they come out suddenly. They do need, they do work out quite early on. They need these sort of large light cruisers. And there are more details about the C's and D's in the videos about them. But let's go through the Emerald and Enterprise. They have a length of 173.7 meters overall. 163 meters, at sort of, once you get back down to the more narrow bit. Uh, beam 16.61 meters, draft 4.95 meters in mean. So it's quite good for light cruisers, large light cruisers. The thing is, it's their 80,000 ship horsepower and their ability to do 33 knots, range of 8,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. And the fact that the whole system is designed basically around two destroyer sets, Shakespeare class destroyers. So, you know. It's something. It's a set which is well known, well proven, and they are planning on building three, maybe more of these ships. The third, of course, is cancelled. Um, armor, three inch sides, machinery spaces, two and a quarter inch sides, magazines, two inch sides aft, one inch on the deck. Again, very much light cruiser world. Now, if we consider the Hawkins class, as that was brought up. They have one and a half inch to three inch main belt, one and two one and a half inch decks, three inch conning tower, one and a half to one inch also get an extra around the magazines. There is a world of difference in the armor. Also, there is the classic thing that you can usually tell a light cruiser from a heavy cruiser by the emphasis it places on destroy on torpedoes. Okay, a light cruiser will tend to place more emphasis on torpedoes than a heavy cruiser because a light cruiser relies on torpedoes as a counter to heavy cruisers, battleships, and everything above. A heavy cruiser relies on her torpedoes just as counters to battleships. They're designed to carry 12 21-inch torpedoes in four treble mounts. Now, the interesting thing is the guns. Enterprise tests out a double gun turret, which will be designed is eventually adopted in the Leander and Alfusa classes. So she's the test bed for that. So instead of having two single mounts forward, she has one double turret forward, which allows all sorts of different modifications to be put to it. Which is why I treat them as two very different classes, because in many ways Enterprise is has had her engines pushed around has had her conning tower she has a county class style conning tower we're going to get into this in a second all these sort of things which are pres uh, predate so that is where they come from they are the large light cruisers they're the genesis of what the royal navy would be going down the route of i you'd have a mixture of light cruisers and you'd have heavy cruisers heavy cruisers are enforcement your large light cruisers are your surface raiders your light cruisers are your commerce protection and scouts. Broadly speaking, broadly speaking, what they're for. There will always be ships used for other things in either emergencies or the fact that they have the capability to do so, so they'll get used to it. No plan survives first contact with the enemy and no theory does. Right. 
starts off in home waters for almost a year in the case of Enterprise, but then she goes and joins her sister in 4th Cruiser Squadron in the East Indies. Um, she doesn't get called into Nanking. In Nanking, uh, she is basically held off. And it's partially she's held off to sort of help deter the Japanese from interfering too much. She comes back for another care. She's more often comes back than Emerald. And the reason for this is they're keeping very good close eye on her turret mount. They want to check its fatigue. They want to see if there's any problems popping up. Because if they can find problems turning up in her mount, before they start to turn up in the other vessels which we fitted with for that mount, they can better anticipate and protect against it. And so I'm going to now expand again so you can see the picture. And I'm not sure why that has decided to pop up there, but I'll disappear it off. Now, HMS Enterprise, as you can see, has a slight, has a different profile to Emerald, but still got the free tunnels there. Free funnels, I mean, not tunnels. <laughs> Sorry. Um, she's got the fighter mounted aft on a launch platform. She has all the things which you'd expect in the class, but she is it's a two-ship class, and they are two quite different ships. Enterprise's version and Kingsons is dealing with Haile Selassie. She is the ship sent to rescue him. He has fleed to French territory, but the French are worried about the Italians using it as a pretext to enter their territory and possibly widen the war. And they don't want it to be a pretext. So the British go, fine, we'll take them. Because the British don't like what the Italians are doing, but they don't want to do anything about it because they've got enough on their own plate and they are in the middle of preparing. And it's, it's 1936. Britain is now starting to agree the odds of war are coming quite quickly. But they know they're not prepared for it. They know they haven't been living the CV passum parabellum belief. And they're now trying to drastically prepare for it, to try and prevent it. And, if we go down, H another town class cruiser, HMS Man Manchester, release Enterprise. So let's put this for it. HMS Liverpool relieves HMS Emerald. HMS Manchester relieves HMS Enterprise. There is no coincidence that the E-class cruisers are relieved by town-class cruisers. They fulfill the same role. That is why they are based where they are based. They are the surface raiders, but Britain's not sticking them right in the face of the Japanese. Not until they need to. And then it's HMS Birmingham somewhere. They are held at a distance. But as Nanking shows, they can react very quickly and be there as a vital part of a fleet if they need to be. In 1938, she was employed to take crews into the China station. Again, there were threats with Japan at the time, and so she was the obvious vessel to take the crews through, because she was an extra threat, which wasn't a threat. She had a good reason. She's bringing crews out. The fact that she's our second line of surface radar doesn't matter. She's bringing crews out. And we haven't got enough of the first line ones in service yet, so we still really need her. Wartime. She has a very busy war. Enterprise has a very busy, very hard war. Now, I've been doing some more maths on that gold. Gold is very attractive to certain people. Uh, and I can understand why. It's very pretty. But uh, she takes one of the operations. She takes ten million in in then gold to Canada, which would be six hundred fifty eight million in today's currency. Apparently, that's a lot of gold. I could almost buy myself a navy for that. Well, I couldn't actually. Can maybe buy a, ta a, ta a Type thirty one frigate. Anyway, in April nineteen forty, she was transferred to the Home Fleet. Then she goes on to Force H, where she does all sorts of things with Meza Kabir. She uh, particularly gets close to that. And she also takes part in Operation Hurry to put aircraft into Malta. And then she goes down to Cape Town. 
And then she takes part in an operation uh, with a county class HMS Cumberland, town class Newcastle, HMS Newcastle, and searching for four. Then she goes into the Indian Ocean, again returning to the Indian Ocean. She uh, she bank, uh, go, joins up with Hermes to hunt down the Admiral Shear. You know, she has a very busy war. And one thing that can't be forgotten is that in 1942, she is one of the first ships not only to do so but to volunteer she volunteered and then she went to pick up survivors from cornwall and dorsetshire no one knew if there was still japanese aircraft japanese carriers really hanging around they didn't think they were they thought the flames up saying move off but they didn't know this ship goes in she goes in with two destroyers paladin and panther and they pick up the survivors Enterprise has a very busy war. Very, very busy war. Right then. On Christmas Day 1942, she returns to Clyde and she is fixed, basically. She has a year of modernization and this is the ship which comes out. I found some, well, fairly good pictures thanks to a book which is well known to you all by now. So... What she looks like in 1943-4 and 1944-5. You can still see she keeps the single six-inch mounts. They are useful, but several of them get replaced with various forms of machine guns and various other systems get added in and air defense. They know some get the four-inch ones get replaced more than the six-inch. Uh, but we'll get into that in a second. And... She has, again, a successful war. She managed, on 28th, she used, engaged a force of 11 German destroyers and torpedo boats. Um, as part of this force she's with, with, you know, HMS, uh, with HMNZ as Ga Gambia, that's the Royal New Zealand Navy Gambia, town, uh, Crown Colony class cruiser, town class HMS Glasgow, our fuser class HMS Penelope, and they had some destroyers, etc. Um, all sorts of things got involved. And she then takes part in bombardment with Force A and this time, rather than relying on the yellow note, I've copied it out and printed it so I don't lose what I was looking for. See, what I do when I have the time. She was in subgroup Assault Force U for Utah Beach. She was the lead ship for this. And she took part in the bombardment of St. Martin de Varel, uh, the coastal defense of Cherbourg. Um, during the action, both her captain and commander were wounded, and she's brought back to Portland by the first lieutenant and lieutenant commander Brown. Yes, the first lieutenant is actually a lieutenant commander, because the first lieutenant is another title. Lieutenant commander was his rank. 20 days later, she was involved in the bombardment of Kirkville, um, silencing the German guns there. And all in all, during D-Day and the ensuing operations, she fired some region of 9,006-inch shells and required two overnight gun changes at Portsmouth, where her barrels were all changed out. In July, she was deployed off the French coast to support British operations, and she provides naval gunfire support for two days for British attacks near Cane uh, with HMS Mauritius and HMS Roberts, the Monitor. And in September, she was deployed to, to do the same thing off the Dutch coast in support of the 2nd Army, although she actually was not required to fire. She has a very interesting war. A very hard war. For some reason, the Canadians don't want her after that. I, I can't think why. It's probably sensible. And, you yeah. know. But really, the interesting thing is the, how the hard war is reflected in her armament. Now, her armament is... Seven six-inch mounted in one double turret and five single mounts. That's pretty much as built in August 1939. 8.5-inch machine guns mounted in two quadruple mount guns. That's four two-pounder pom-pom single guns and 16 21-inch mounted in four quadruple torpedo tubes. She keeps basically the, the torpedo mount the same way through and the six-inch mount is, is the same the whole way through. 
However, by 1943, she now has 12 two-pounder pom-pom guns mounted in two quads and four singles. By Also by 1943, she has 12 20mm and six dual-power operated guns. Between 44 and 45, she has a further six single 20mm guns added. And that's the interesting thing. One of the reasons that she doesn't really get used anymore is because, as we well know, two pounders are roughly 40, uh, 40 millimeters. They were looking in uh, the sheer amount of 40 millimeters they would have to fit to her, crew her, man her, and they decided to go with newer cruisers, newer ships coming through. But her growth in armament really does testify to the sheer amount of anti-aircraft firepower you needed for these operations. You needed uh, at this time. Also, it's not a bad mounting she has but in, for August 1939. I would agree by 42, that's a terrible mounting, that really she should be having more by this point. But, yeah. And then I would say 43 to 44, that isn't bad for the theatre, she said. Honestly, if she'd been heading out to the Far East, 40mm would have been the way to go, but you know, she's a good ship, and she does well. The E-Class are good cruisers. They are very capable cruisers, they are very fast cruisers. 33 knots. Their conception is they are the large anti-surface radar slash surface radar. So they're the large light cruisers. They are the model for which the town class, that's the 1930s town class, are based upon. I've said all this before during this talk, but I want to emphasize it. And let's see. So that's the normal stuff, which I say, you know, what's coming up, Enterprise in here. Except today, but also we've got Patreon Video 4, we've got the Battle Tech Seal, could Crete have been saved in 1941? All these are coming up. Iron Bro. Uh, actually, I will point out, I fill these with water most of the time, so they're not just soda, they're not just bottles discarded sitting here pointlessly. They get filled up with water, which on very hot days I need a lot of. Because mainly I'm doing this all from my office slash bedroom, so to get in and out of here I have to do all sorts of fun things. It's not it's a bit cramped in mind. Enterprise there is a reason that the rampant lion on a red background still is in service today and is currently her current namesake is in Beirut. I think it's still there, doing a survey. This is a name with a lot of tradition in the Royal Navy. And was a very successful ship. Now, again, they're both ships are, I didn't mention this earlier, they are started off in private yards, Armstrong and John Brown, but they're completed at Chatham and Devonport. It's save money, and it's one of the reasons why there's such a gap between their construction, launch, and completion, because they move. What's interesting, again, is that Emerald and Enterprise, the difference in weight, that is mostly down to the turret. That adds an extra 30 tons. It also makes her slightly heavier forward, and they have to balance that out in Enterprise's design. But broadly speaking, they keep about roughly the same trim lines. Those engines chosen were actually were very reliable models. They were chosen from the Shakespeare class, and they were doubled up. They had forty thousand short ship horsepower. She has eighty thousand ship horsepower. That's a very useful amount to have. It generates a lot of speed for her capability. But compared to some of the cruisers you'd be building in the nineteen thirties. The armor, three inch sides, machinery spaces only. Two and a quarter inch sides on the magazines. And two inch sides aft, one inch deck. Now, you'll notice if you're looking at that, 
that that is actually slightly uh, it's differing uh, differentially located but in some places actually thicker than what's put on the hawkins class and again this fits their role okay hawkins class are heavy cruisers these are large light cruisers this their role is to engage surface raiders potentially surface raiders are cruisers so in effect you could say this is actually those cruisers could be quite big and quite heavy cruisers so you have enough armor to get yourself your, yourself close enough you can launch your torpedoes armament three four inch guns they're rapid firing and they are to an extent aa capable as well two and two two pounders Again, AA capable. This is how they begin their life. And 12 torpedoes, 21 inch torpedoes in four treble mounts. They're good ships. They're a lot of fun, too. Anything else I've missed? One aircraft, of course, the whole way through. Mostly uh, starts off with flycatchers, then moves on to sea foxes and kingfisher as well. She gets up to so much. Those sides are so full of text. So that's what we have coming up. We have, of course, today it's Enterprise and Emerald. And before that, that's going to, I am going to hit that shower quickly. And we also have Patreon Media 4 on Monday, which is the Sing Titans and the Ghost Hop, which I've been doing lots of recording for with Daniel. And we've got lots and lots of things to go live over the coming couple of days. They're probably going to start going up. Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday. And of course, we've got brew ships on Sunday. So that's going to be fun to look forward to. And I'm saying fun a lot, or a lot, I think, because I finally reached the level of heat exhaustion. So um, I'm going to say thank you very much for watching this. I hope you found it useful, and I hope you'll join me later for the live when we're discussing the E class cruisers and all they got up to, why they were built, and what they were for. Thank you very much. <laughs>